I have to have a disclaimer. Um, I'm not going to talk about maps that are saving the earth. Disclaimer. <laughs> I don't think maps are going to save the earth. Um, I want to start by respectfully acknowledging the lands that we are on. We are on the Greater Salish uh, traditional peoples and give thanks and gratitude for being able to stand here today on whose land, delta, language, traditions, and to share the possibilities for a future to be possible. This is a serious time. There are some problems, but I think we're mostly aware of these, so I'll just flip through them. There's a, quite a few problems surrounding us, sufferings, but there's no reason why we can't address these problems with the notion that a future is possible. And this last one is from the great land rush happening in Missoula where I live. These are the kind of homes that I'm embarrassed to say that my generation is building. Well, what could possibly be going wrong? For 15,000 years, salmon have, have been going upstream. What could possibly go wrong? We build a dam. I think the economic, the separation of economics and ecology is one of those things that has gone wrong. And oikos is the Greek word from which both economics and ecology derive. If we put them back together, we have the household of the earth, the economics of the household. If it's economic, it's ecological. If it's ecological, it's economic. And looking at it from this perspective, what could possibly go wrong? Well, that continuous fishing for salmon at the Kettle Falls of the Columbia. And I lived there for uh, 10 years. This is an amazing place, but it's underwater. And this island, uh, when the dam uh, was dropped down, um, the native people in the area go back out and set their teepees up. It doesn't happen very often. This is a, one of those covers I did 20 years ago for cartographic perspectives. This cover was called this is mine, that is yours. Dividing up the land, once again, kind of ignores that great complexity of the community. And we become separated from it. There's a wonderful essay by Gary Snyder that I read in preparing for this talk on wilderness. And it's wonderful because it draws us back into that notion of wilderness as part of us. We are the wilderness. We are part of the Willards, we're not separate from. And yet it is an important concept in the world today. Right map making emerged, this was 20 years ago in St. Louis. Um, this broadside was passed out to a similar NASIS conference. And I uh, also reread re this um, and stumbled across the fine print at the top. That most obvious characteristic of our age is its destructiveness. That's Thomas Merton. Um, I'm not sure if he was murdered or not, but he died in his bathtub, uh, electrocuted. But what a wonderful um, man. And it goes on to say the problem for the maker of maps being that our maps are in part engaged in the active and wanton destruction of the world. We should actually reread that and listen to that. That's kind of sobering. Leap across that boundary of these maps that we see are so beautiful. They are gorgeous. The data is amazing. It is very seductive and we get engaged in that seductiveness 
But are these maps engaged in the destruction or the future of the world? We seriously need to ask that. And map making offers a way, right map making offers some possibilities of how that might happen and how that might be possible. It along with what I would call the Green New Deal, um, the Extinction Rebellion, and various different um, uh, uh, voices that are emerging to say, we want a future. How can we get a future? We don't necessarily need beautiful maps to get there. They may be more of a distraction. I'm not sure. But I'm not sure either that we can get there. But I sure hope we can act to get there, take action. So I found myself looking at hands, about hands that were engaged with the earth. So this connection with the tactile, the wet, the sloppy presence of the earth. And I found myself fascinated by all these ways in which we engage with the earth itself, with pigments, with fabric, with, with soil. This may seem like I'm off on some tangent somewhere. I probably am. Nothing like a muddy hand. I once asked my third graders when I was in Oakland uh, working as an artist in the school to tell me how many minutes in a day they actually touched the earth. You can ask yourself, how many minutes in a day do you actually touch soil, rock? Most of the time, we avoid it. But these were hands that were engaged in that in different ways. And I found that actually quite interesting because it sort of led me to something, oh, my, this is from my local CSA, the farmers. They were impressed by the size of the uh, stuff they were growing and delivering to us. And this is one of my third graders having just finished a performance piece um, using chalk to map out where he thought the, uh, the creek was beneath the school. So there's this greater community out there. It's an immense community of diversity and presence. The question I find asking is, can our maps offer solutions? Does more data really help? And as I started to ask these questions and explore this, I realized, and, and again, after rereading re -reading, uh, Gary's essay, how much we are a part. This is, um, of course, Yosemite. And if you look closely, you can see an eagle that these uh, people are pointing to. And it, it, all that being interwoven, um, when I grew up, I was captivated by the wilderness without anybody being there. But this notion of that we are part of a wilderness has kind of changed my perspective on things. And this is my running community, and we spent a day running across the Bob Marshall Wilderness together. We are part of a larger, always part of communities. We have our own cartographic community here, but in our local lives, we're part of communities. And so I'm going to diverge here a minute and just say that part of this talk formed while I was out on a long run with, a, with an ultra running group and we run across the um, Beaverhead uh, wilderness area in the Idaho-Montana border. This is Lemhi Pass where the Shoshone took Lewis and Clark across uh, for the first time into the Pacific. This run is amazing opportunity to dance across some of the most wild country. This is the Continental Divide, and yes, we are going on that ridge. It's 2,000 feet down into Montana and 2,000 feet down into Idaho. And you get that sense that you are part of this miracle. 
that's a, if you, and again, you have to look very closely here to, um, to see the runners coming down from the top there. Well, while I was doing that run, I found myself thinking about a little tiny book that Robert Bly gave me 50 years ago. I was, uh, had just, um, it was 1970, and I had just uh, witnessed, I was on the Kent State uh, campus and was present there during that event. I had, my lottery number uh, was just given to me, this first year of the lottery. The, I was very nervous that I might, my lottery my number might come up. So I went to the border of Minnesota and Ontario, where I was familiar with the canoe country, and I was curious about maps. And so one night, I went to visit one of the founders, or one of the writers of the Wilderness Act, and asked him what it was like to canoe with, before there were maps. And he said there were, no, there were always maps. And I found this actually quite interesting because of course there were always maps. There's 12, 15,000 years of spatial information. When I come back from a run and say to my wife, the bitterroot are flowering, here's where you can go to see them. I'm transmitting that same kind of spatial information. 15,000 years of it maybe along this divide. Well, Robert hands me this book, and I'm about ready to cross a divide, and he says, here, take this. This is a small poem about ducks. This is beautiful. I'd never seen anything like this. It was hand-printed, beautiful paper, hand-stitched with a beautiful blue um, uh, ribbon, hand-tied on the inside, four or five pages just introducing this poem and the poem is just three lines it doesn't have a library of congress number it, it this is the migration edition he says i think there was maybe only 50 copies that's it it's gone it wasn't 10,000 copies it wasn't reprint i think he did reprint it though and he hands me this i've had it for my last 50 years I take it with me. It reminds me of Robert. He's a lifelong friend. He's, in the poem it says, it's very simple, it just says, three, white du uh, three ducks waddle past my door, moving fast. They are needed somewhere. This is what he called a leaping poem. Y you've got to leap. And I think that maps that can leap for us can help us. Anyway, this is, I'm going to use Robert's little poem to say, give us some examples of what we might do to make maps for our future to be possible. But the end of the small print at the top says, thus awakened, we vow to take right effort and engage in cartographic disobedience map making for a future to be possible unacceptable it is not to act those last words are from the Smokey the Bear Sutra unacceptable it is not to act but this actually really interests me thus awakened I, I can't I can't really answer that how do you awaken how do you awaken somebody how do you awaken yourself I'm not sure about that and then also, how do you convince somebody who has awakened to act? How many of us are acting? Five minutes. So, the first of my four notions to push against what seems like a closed door for this painful and suffering in the world and we can push against this door, we can do it, is we need to employ the community. And I mean this in the most local sense. And this is the economic sense of Oikos. Employ the people around you. 
in your local community, in all aspects of your map making. Employ them, give them employment that engages them in your vision for a future to be possible. And here we have students employed in a map making of a sundial. And this book, My Mighty Journey, it's very cool. I got this in the Twin Cities recently. It's, um, it's a wonderful story about the Mississippi River. And this production employed a lot of people locally in, in the community of making these beautiful prints that he did and the story of this waterfall over uh, millennia and it's how it moves. Oops. So this is another example of, uh, the, okay, that was the first, that was the first. The second is be organic. This is the ecological aspect of it, and I mean organic in the most broad sense and the notion how it emerged. This apple is organic because of the way I raised it, but it's also organic because it's in season, and it's also organic because it was locally transported. It came from my backyard. And those are the three primary aspects of what we like to think of as organic. Not just not spraying, but getting something that's not sprayed out of season from Peru is not my idea of organic. So maps that are organic have the ability to return to the compost pile in all aspects of it, whether that's the material, the ink, and uh, and this map is fascinating because it's a watershed map in a um, natural history uh, place, but all of the watercolors used to paint it are come from soils in that area, in that part of the watershed. Absolutely amazing. So the effort was made to make this local. And this piece is of this woman, is of this woman's son who was having a hard time breathing. It's just, it's just this letterpress piece of, of lungs with this wonderful music set to letterpress in just a small edition. It's done. It's not worried about printing it out on a computer. It's, it has a tactileness to it. This one is in Washington, D.C. It's a fabric. These are um, the third aspect of what I wanted to say is that it's local. Think small, both in production. There's nothing wrong with an edition that goes out of print, like ducks. And these students were mapping out where they thought the watershed was. This one is in uh, the Missoula Art Museum, and it's the uh, just last week, 128 years ago, the Salish forced march were forced out of their homeland. So this is a beadwork piece of that. Again, a, a woodcut of a bicycle trip. And this is a piece of mine um, on the Vermilion River. The fourth one, the fourth aspect is if we can't see it, we can't see it, so we don't really believe it exists, and to challenge that notion. It may actually exist. And the interesting one here is the um, Tibetans who make these uh, sand paintings, sand mandalas, and then destroy them. And you see here, this piece is a response to that bearing witness of when the Buddha was enlightened, which the sand mandalas are actually responding to by returning them to their place. That's it. If you got one of these, that was on your that means you were on my mailing list. That's a hand edition piece. Time's up. <laughs>